And we are live. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> and we are live. Welcome, everyone, to the Melon Initiative. I'm Dr. Kimberly Madison, a doctorally prepared nurse practitioner, and one of your co-hosts here at the Melon Initiative podcast. I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Geraldine, an NP, and Alicia, a nurse who happens to be director as well. Okay, people, she makes the money. <laughs> In healthcare, there she's going to regret saying that. <laughs> and she was telling us that earlier. So. It's fresh on my mind. <laughs> In healthcare, there is often too much information and not enough time. Here at the Melanin Initiative, we avoid TMI by breaking things down into language you can understand. We create a safe space to ask your questions and share a nur nursing perspective without taking up too much of your time. Today, we'll be talking about maternal health. Uh, by the end of the episode, we hope that you understand uh, the outcomes that exist here in America compared to other countries. The importance of having an advocate, postpartum depression, prenatal care, and what it means to have a healthy and supportive pregnancy and postpartum period. And as always, we like to give our disclaimer. This show is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are our opinions alone and are not a representation of any of our affiliations. If you're experiencing a medical emergency, you should seek medical attention um, and medical guidance from your primary care, from your healthcare provider. Um, and if you're having a physical emergency, you should contact 911. And if you're having a mental health emergency, you should call 988. Thanks. So I think, you know, this topic was, we were a little uneasy to have this conversation. One, because none of us here are mothers and also none of us here um, specialize in maternal health. So a little bit of uncomfortable topic for us. I, I, I'm not uncomfortable about the topic. <laughs> Geraldine and I. <laughs> Geraldine and I felt a little uncomfortable uh, with the topic. However, we thought it's so important to share this mm -hmm. topic with you all and to have this discussion because although um, the United States is, you know, one of the most advanced industrialized civilizations uh, in the world, when it comes to maternal health and health outcomes for our mothers, uh, we have very poor outcomes. Yeah. And especially for our um, Black and African American mothers, we have very poor outcomes. So for those of you who are listening, I have just shared an image on our screen regarding maternal health. And in 2020, the U.S. maternal mortality rate was 23.8 deaths per 100,000 live births, with 861 known deaths due to maternal causes. It is crucial to note that this is not the case in similar countries and is far from inevitable. The United States continues to be an outlier among industrialized nations with a maternal mortality rate several times higher than other high-income countries. The maternal mortality rate in the United States is nearly three times higher than that of France, the country with the next highest rate. Um, ladies, what are your thoughts and feelings on that statistic and uh, how that has impacted maybe your care of others or maybe loved ones that you um, or friends that you have in your circles? Those numbers are quite like alarming, especially as you mentioned, us being um, an advanced country and for us to have um, such high mortality rates when it comes to uh, maternal um, health. It does, I personally have, like I said, I don't really have much experience in the maternal um, health as, um, sector. However, um, I get patients that come in that I see that might be pregnant, that may, might be coming in for something else, but they are pregnant. And I'm all, always concerned about their, like, even though that's not what they're coming in for, I'm always concerned about their pregnancy and how it's going. Um, and just making sure that I'm giving, you know, making sure that they're getting the care that they need, um, even if it's not for me, definitely guiding them and directing them where they need to go. As well as like family members, I've had family members that have been pregnant and um, I'm always concerned about their health and their well-being as well as the, uh, their um, baby. Yeah, so when we talk about maternal health, we're really talking about you know who you're gonna see if you're either um, what we call planning for to have a family, mm -hmm. you're currently pregnant, you have complications or you just had a baby. So they, that provider, whether it's a physician, nurse practitioner, or physician associate, they might specialize in gynecology, obstetrics, or women's health. Particularly if they're an NP, they tend to label themselves as a women's health provider. And so, like we talked about before, primary care, they would be taking care of all that. So in the acute care setting in the hospital, 
typically they're still going to go to like a women's health unit unless maybe they need cardiac monitoring or they need something that we can, that only we can do. Cause I know during COVID, I definitely took care of quite a few pregnant women. Um, and so they'll still have those women health experts kind of guiding that care. Um, and they they usually are pretty good. They think they're really actually on top of it. You're going to, you're going to see them every ship. And so one of the things that we always see is like, they want to bring their family, they want to bring their children. And we have to have those tough conversations because it's not really a place for children, especially young children. And so, um, but we can still support them if they're breastfeeding or lactating and we can store that and do that kind of thing. So on that map that we had, you can see, unfortunately, a lot of the darker shaded areas represent poor outcomes, meaning there's more infants dying either before, during, or after pregnancy, after labor. And if you notice, a lot of those dark shaded areas are what we call the um, Bible Belt, like the southeast part of the country. And unfortunately, there's a those numbers are the portions of the population that are really affected by that are black and brown communities. So yeah, we have to ask why. If we have all this money, if we have all this knowledge, all this power, we're leaders in so many areas. What's so different when it comes to that community? And the reason we're doing this topic is because we believe is a lack of knowledge, a lack of information. And so we're going to try to highlight some of that key information and emphasize what you should have to make sure you don't end up one of those statistics. Great. So, you know, along those lines, you know, we, we've talked about this before and it's super important, but you have to have a health advocate that's there for you and someone who can speak for you or help you to understand things that you may not understand. Um, so in maternal, the maternity world, there's a special advocate that, um, it's called a doula. So that's something that's you know, you know unique to this particular uh, sector of healthcare. And birth doulas are typically non-medical professionals trained to support you throughout your pregnancy and during your birth. Doulas focus on the emotional and educational experience of your journey toward parenthood by providing resources that can help improve your pregnancy and birth experience. So, you know, it's important to have your medical providers there to guide you with your medical, any complications, or even just kind of help guiding you through what to expect throughout your pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, some people also consider having a midwife or a doula mm -hmm. or um, a different kind of health advocate who um, some are, med you know, a midwife will be a, another medical professional, but a doula may not be a medical uh, professional. And they're, they're also there to support you throughout your pregnancy. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. So yeah, so a midwife is typically a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. So after, a, so you become a nurse first, you can get that degree a number of ways. But once you move on to get your master's degree, you go back to graduate school and you can pick different tracks. Some of us choose a clinical track. Some of us choose executive administration, right? But if you choose one of the clinical areas, we have different uh, what we call populations, mm -hmm. and one of those populations is women's health. And you can and you would pick the midwifery program. And it started in Kansas, right? Don't they always tell us like the Frontier <laughs> University? It's like, a, it's like a big deal. All the other specialties you don't really hear where they right. start, right. but like that one gets a whole chapter. <laughs> but anyway, so to be a midwife, and what's a you know a, a trend? It's been a trend for some time now is more women are choosing to have what we call a home birth, mm -hmm. birth at home. And one of the things they emphasize is like, that's how it was for centuries, right. generations. And then, you know, people will rebut and say, yes, but women were also dying for centuries right. during right. labor, too. So it's definitely a sensitive topic and it's a, it's a topic you should make informed and supported. But yeah, so typically you can, and you can see a midwife in any facet, mm -hmm. but for people who are choosing to have home births, they will t they might they will typically have a midwife that's coming to do that mm -hmm. and that midwife will also might have their own doula mm -hmm. and then you as a patient can have your own doula and you it's important to make sure if you're going to have a hospital birth that they allow the doula because yep. there are restrictions on visitation mm -hmm. and you that's just one less thing you want to have to worry about right yeah so i found actually found um so I, even though we don't have children, I was blessed to be named a godmother for the first <laughs> time, little Avery. Aww. Her parents, um, she was born in Michigan, and they were, I don't even know if they were looking for a doula or I recommended it. Knowing my personality, I probably recommended it. <laughs> and so I think I went on, I, I went online and looked for people who were in their area and uh, found a lady. She, they contacted, they interviewed three doulas, right? Because we've talked before. The first person you engage, whether it's therapy or primary care, 
might not be a good fit. Right. So right. you have to kind of go through a few, just like dating. So they went to interview three people. They picked this one. She helped them with their birth plan. And she's a great liaison. Like we're going to provide some information for about 20 minutes and then we're gone. But they're there to say, you know, to dis, um, dissect medical language, tell you things like make sure I'm allowed to come. Uh, and then she'll, they'll also tell you like what their availability is, right? Mm -hmm. Because if they're waiting on someone to have birth, they don't always know when that's going to happen. And then after you have your baby, they might still be able to provide services. It just depends on them. You have to ask. I'm glad you brought up the whole home birth. So my mm -hmm. uh, sister-in-law actually uh, um, had a home birth with my nephew. He's now four, but Ooh, um, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, right? Seems like yesterday he was just born, but um, he, uh, so she had a home birth. Unfortunately, I wasn't there because I'm in uh, the DMV and they're in Miami, but um, she had a midwife. She had, and I also believe a doula was present um, and everything went well. And um, people always often are kind of scared of home births. And I, I initially, I was a little afraid for her to have a home birth, but her pregnancy didn't really have many complications. And I think she opted for that home birth um, because it was just more comfortable for her. Um, and then she also witnessed her sister have two mm -hmm. home births. And I think that also kind of helped her like make her decision on doing it. And even after uh, my nephew was born, um, she reached like she was able to still reach out to that mm -hmm. midwife and that doula to get kind of get that support because she's a new mother. Um, there was a certain a minor complication with my nephew and then we got everything figured out and everything was fine. But it's great to have that mm -hmm. like those um, those uh, people available to help during that time. Yeah, because actually speaking of my goddaughter, so her mom's, even though she was in the room, there were times where like, you know, the other person gets tired or they yeah. need to go to sleep or yeah. they need to shower, go home and take care of the dogs. Right. And so the duel is able to stay there, rub your back. Maybe they have mm -hmm. more patience. Maybe they can find humor and help relieve some of the stress. And then they don't lose their cool. Right. Because inevitably labor never goes as planned. And you need someone who remembers what your plan is, yep. speaks for you when you can't speak for yourself and maintains the, the importance of what you want at the end is a healthy baby. Right, absolutely. So, you know, um, we, we, talk, we talk always about having a health advocate and the importance of a health advocate here on the TMI Melon Initiative. Um, I wanna dive a little bit into um, some, another hot topic in maternity health, which is uh, postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. So postpartum depression is a, is a common mental health condition that can affect anyone. While it can feel hard or lonely healing from postpartum depression, postpartum depression, it is possible. About one in eight women actually report symptoms of postpartum depression in the year after giving birth. That's a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, giving birth and then one year later, you can still be experiencing postpartum symptoms. Everyone experiences it differently. Feelings of sadness, anxiety, or overwhelming are some signs. You may not feel connected to your baby, or you might not feel love or care for the baby. And these feelings... If these feelings are lasting longer than two weeks, you may be considered to have postpartum depression. Other symptoms that um, that people that can experience is like not, and these are like subtle signs, not taking care of yourself or not right. wanting to care for the baby. Like if, and it's very important um, that you, if you are the one experiencing the postpartum depression, you might not know that that's what you're experiencing, mm -hmm. but having like family members mm -hmm. around that are aware right. of the signs and symptoms are super important because then you can get your loved one um, the help that they need. Right, that goes back to those advocates, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, especially, you know, that time right after birth, you know, a lot of mothers need a lot of support, mm -hmm. not only for the baby, but I think people forget about the mom, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. like the baby, everyone has all the attention on yeah. the baby, but sometimes people forget about the mom. So having a support person there for you, it's also as important as having a support person there for the baby, the new the new infant in your life. Mm -hmm. We also understand that everyone has like family members available. There there are single moms. There are um, but there are support groups that are out there that you can reach out to to get that support if you don't have immediate family or friends around, um, so that you're not going through it alone. Right, and you know there is there's always treatment options available. You know something that you know, you may if you're comfortable taking medication. You know you may reach out to that primary care provider and seek some support. Maybe your OBGYN mm -hmm. uh, physician, or maybe your doula or your nurse midwife or anything, any, any provider that you, a friend, any, anybody that you need to go to, to say, if you're having some, if you need, if you're having an issue, you need some help, reach out to them and we, they will find you the resources. 
There's also therapy. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there, as uh, Joey mentioned, there are support groups. Sometimes just talking to other women mm-hmm. and realizing that you're not alone and there are other people out there experiencing what you're experiencing, that does help for that. That, that helps for some people, you know? Like they want to know that they're not alone in all of this. And they're not the only one experiencing it. They're not the only one going through um, postpartum depression. Exactly. You brought up two really important things is that disconnect with the baby because every movie, every book, every fairy tale has this relate, this automatic bond with mom. Right. Right. And if you don't have because a lot of times it's so very popular right now is scheduling C-sections. Right. right? And what happens with that, or even if you even if you get um, epidural, you what a lot of women have reported is that they don't have any sensation. And so whether they're having epidural or anesthesia, they really weren't even fully present right. for the birth. And they that discon- that's a lot of times where the initial bonding, that burst of you know love comes. And so when that's gone, not only do they not remember it, they also don't have that connection with their baby. And who wants to admit that? Right. Yeah. Not to yourself, not to other people. So yeah, that's a huge one, right? And then the overwhelming. You have so many new responsibilities. You did not get a manual. It's okay, right? You're trying to do everything perfect. Uh, There was some funny memes online, like make sure your baby's clean, but that they're never starving. And it it was just like, all. it's like, okay, how are you supposed to do that? You know, how can you do all those things? Um, And I think sometimes it's just like pointing out really simple stuff. Because when I was looking at that doula, I found about all these resources available for pregnant women. There's a lady who caters, who just provides meals for the first right. two weeks. And you just like, you always want to help, right? Especially if you haven't had children, you're not quite sure what else you can do besides buy onesies. And it's like, <laughs> once, once, I saw that, once I saw that, I was like, oh, now that's something I can understand. And right. because they were really into cooking, I know that that, and, there's still, and the other partner was still working full time. Right. And you still have all your household responsibilities. So who's going to do the cooking now? Yeah. You're going to spend all your money ordering out every day. Right. That's not even realistic. Yeah. Right. So that's one way you can support someone. And that's one place you can ask for help. Maybe it's you get someone treats you to a, a, a maid and cleans the house. Things that you were doing before. It's not going to take away from you being a good mom. It's right. not going to take away from you being a good spouse or partner. Mm-hmm. This is a temporary phase and everyone needs help at some time. Yeah, exactly. And I like that you pointed out it's all, you know, we all like you pointed out, we always focus on the um the baby when right. the baby's born. Mm-hmm. I had a friend that had um a child two years ago and during her like at her baby shower, her registry didn't only have baby gifts, mm-hmm. it also had like things that the uh, mom might need postpartum. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was great. And That's I think a good that idea. yeah, mm-hmm. like it had like like nursing pad, it had a bunch oh, yeah. of different things that you wouldn't think to like gift. You're all you're so focused on the baby, but mom is important in the um, whole process as well. Social media has been great with that because mm-hmm. people are coming on, posting their videos, showing you how to put together that postpartum kit. You can just buy an empty basket, put a list in there and have everyone contribute. Yeah. And that will, because nobody talks about those, all the things that happen after, after baby comes. Right. Yeah, the right. pain, the discharge, the sleepless nights. Yeah. Laundry. <laughs> <laughs> laundry. <laughs> so many diapers, but oh where's the... <laughs> Detergent, right? Oh, yeah. And I, I went to go to like Marshalls or something, and you, I got a huge thing for like five bucks. So I sent that to somebody. Yeah, all these things you just, you just don't think about. Yeah. yeah. So one other thing that we want to talk about before we um, leave our conversation for today is prenatal care. Mm-hmm. So something that's also very very important in our maternal health journey. So for those who don't know, prenatal care is the medical care you get during pregnancy. At each visit, your healthcare provider checks on you and your growing baby. So you have to call your primary care provider and you go to your first prenatal checkup as soon as you know you're pregnant, okay? And then you go to all your prenatal prenatal, uh, care checkups, even if you're feeling fine. So this isn't just a checkup Mm -hmm. when you don't feel well. These are regular checkups to make sure you and baby are growing the way you should be. Getting early and regular prenatal care can help you have a healthy and a full-term baby. Now, full term means your baby is born between 39 weeks and 40 weeks. Um, Being born full term gives your baby the right amount of time they need to grow in the womb and develop. Okay, so your question may be asking yourself, well, who can I go to for prenatal care? So you can get prenatal care from different providers. You can go to an obstetrician gynecologist, which is also known as the OBGYN. And that's a doctor who has education and training to take care of pregnant women and deliver babies. You can go to a family practice doctor or provider, 
And that's a provider who takes care of every member of your family. And I think you remember that conversation from our primary care provider conversation. This doctor will take care of you before, during, and after pregnancy. You can also see uh, someone who specializes in maternal fetal medicine, which is a specialist in, in OB with education and training to take care of women who have high risk pregnancies. You can also go see a certified nurse midwife who we've mentioned here before, which is a nurse education and training to take care of women of all ages, including pregnant women. And then you can always go see a family nurse practitioner or a woman's health nurse <laughs> practitioner. I love that. I'm glad you brought up the high risk category because we do fall in that category a lot as black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. So that's that could be the mother's health. If you have something really, maybe you have uncontrolled asthma, high blood pressure and diabetes at the time of pregnancy. If you're, if you're considered geriatric pregnancy, <laughs> that's going to be high risk. And that begins. <laughs> We're laughing because I think we will all be considered geriatric. <laughs> anyway, continue. <laughs> that begins at the I don't even want to say the age. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. <laughs> you're 35, you're considered to be okay. geriatric in pregnancy world. Yeah. Right. We know that you're not technically geriatric and people continue to have children well right. after that. Sure. But it's just <laughs> the risks go up in terms of like mental development and risk for diabetes and other things like that. So for those high risk people, you might not qualify for, a, you might not be a good candidate for a home birth. You would really have to talk to your provider and of course, at the end of the day, it's your decision. Just make sure you, if you are going to have a home birth and you have been labeled high risk, that you have a plan B in place yes. so you know where you're going to go if, if and when you need to go be seen by someone. All right. So take us on home, Geraldine. So we discussed a um, very, very important topic today, um, talking about maternal health. Um, we Just to wrap up, we discussed the poor, um, poor health hot poor health outcomes in the U.S. compared to other countries. We uh, discussed the importance of having a healthcare advocate, such as a doula. Um, also, we discussed um, postpartum depression and, and what to do if you're having some signs and symptoms of postpartum depression, as well as um, if you are uh, the family member of or a, a friend of a, someone that is experiencing postpartum depression and how to recognize those signs and symptoms. And then we also discussed um, prenatal care and the importance of obtaining prenatal care via your OBGYN or your primary care provider. Um, and we just kind of like, we kind of wrapped up or discussed about how to like have a healthy supportive pregnancy and postpartum period. Yeah, and there's so many resources on YouTube, people telling their stories. And also there's a lot of apps that are supported by national organizations that guide you through each week and it remind you of when you need to go get care done. And I think one of the reasons our communities have such poor outcomes is because of this information yeah. that's not always readily available or shared yeah. or asked. Sometimes mm -hmm. we're not asking um, the support system. And um, yeah, I think, I think we covered it. Yeah. Yeah. So as always, you can email us your questions or show ideas at tmi.melanin at gmail.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Please share the show with your friends. Rate the Apple Podcast and Spotify and leave a comment. It really helps the show get more support and get the message out there to those who need it. You can find our social media links and a list of resources to our conversation today in the description box. We release a new show weekly on TMI Tuesdays at 10 on YouTube and all your favorite podcast apps. Follow, like, and share our content with all your friends. Thank you for watching. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <gasps>